Hello, my name is Ian McCall and this is an overview on Module 7b on excisions of the limbs and some aspects of the histology of melanoma. Now, in this module, you should look at this video on surgery and the limbs. It only lasts about 11 or 12 minutes and it goes over uh, some of the images that are in this particular module and also goes over some of the basic principles uh, and issues that you'll face when you're doing surgery in the limbs. It's becoming a, an increasing problem in elderly patients with very thin skin who develop squamous cells on the lower leg. And the question is how to manage them surgically is the best way in the vast majority when it's any type of invasive SCC. But trying to close these defects is uh, difficult and many of them in fact require skin grafts or as is shown in this uh, particular uh, image fairly extensive flap repairs. Now whether their skin will take it or not is another issue and this is going to be an increasing problem as we uh, as our population ages. So we'll go through this module on surgery of the limbs we're also going to look at the histopathology of melanoma, primarily just contrasting um, melanoma with nevi. The, obviously the histopathology of melanoma is a massive topic, it's particularly when you get into, and, and a very contentious uh, area, particularly when you get into the area of spitzoid or spitz-like melanoma, where everybody has difficulty in uh, trying to classify and correctly diagnose these lesions. Desmoplastic melanoma is another difficult one, difficult to diagnose initially, but also quite difficult to diagnose histopathologically. So we'll deal with it at a relatively superficial level. And this module also looks at tutorial topics. Um, we're going to look at ulcers and a bit about pyoderma ganglionosum. So first of all, let's take a little look at uh, the surgery in the lower limbs. Most of the this module was done by Cliff Rosendahl as part of the diploma course um, of scans on advanced uh, skin cancer medicine and surgery. Basic principles are always the same. Correctly identify and completely remove the tumor. Put reasonable margins on it depending on the nature of the tumor. Preserve function because often in the lower limb you're going to be doing surgery across joints. Cosmesis is um, the least of your concerns. Still important, but certainly um, less important than these first two. And on the limbs especially, you've got to minimize the risk of complications such as infection and vascular compromise. Now, infection is an issue on the lower limbs, particularly below the knee, um, particularly in the elderly who have impaired circulation. Um, vascular complications are also a problem. Bleeding is, a, a, is an issue. There are a lot of veins in the lower leg, easy to transect them. And if patients are on blood thinners, then um, bleeding can be an issue afterwards. So often it's good to bandage uh, these uh, surgical excisions, give them a bit of support in the first 24 to 48 hours. Let's just have a little look at uh, this module in my Skin Cancer Consult. Um, Cliff's divided this into various sections. He's illustrated here the relaxed skin tension lines on the limbs. One of the problems of doing it, you, know, you, you should try and follow these uh, as much as you can. You can see how they, they vary quite a bit. Down here, they're uh, virtually vertical. Here, they're virtually horizontal. What you have to watch with vertical excisions here is that you tend to get a boat-shaped def deformity. You know, it's sunken in the middle. One way to overcome that is to angle it across the circumference of the uh, limb, perhaps as, a, um, as an S-plasty. Uh, so keep that in mind for avoiding that uh, boat-type deformity. 
just get an idea of the resting skin tension uh, skin tension lines here on the on the extremities if you follow those lines many large lesions can simply be taken out by a large uh, ellipse now again when you're closing your large ellipse close it in layers make sure you've got a subcuticular stitch in here that's a uh, dermal stitch that's going to close this uh, this area if you don't then you'll get bleeding into it and the various consequences of that uh, increased risk of wound dehiscence, increased risk of infection. There's a nice subcuticular closure there and then you can put some extends, uh, external uh, nylon stitches here if you, if you require. The aspects of surgery in the shoulder, problem there is uh, the skin's quite tight often and also the tendency for movement and the tendency for keloid formation. All of that has to be taken into consideration as well. You can see in this particular um, excision here, adequate margins put around the lesion, large ellipse and uh, nice running suture closure here, good inverted edges. Of the and a good uh, good healed scar. This was a nice little technique when you've got two lesions. It's called a staggered ellipse, and uh, you can see here this has been done where this part comes up to here, and as that moves up, this part moves up to here, and so you get this type of uh, of scar. It's a nice way if you've got two uh, lesions adjacent to each other and you're having to take them out, you can do them just in the one uh, excision. Surgery in the forearm, again you can see it's angled a little bit here, this is as a form of S-plasty. Um, sometimes you'll do flaps down here to minimize crossing over uh, an area. The back of the hands and the wrists, again, some problems. The skin can be relatively loose here, but relatively thin. In this particular uh, lesion, you can see a rhomboid flap was used to close this defect. So cut out as a square, cut here, this portion up into here initial suture across here to close this defect first and then a little subcuticular stitch here if you can get it in with thin skin like this to hold and then running sutures normally these are interrupted uh, around the outside. This is where a lot of the tension is taken up. You try and avoid crossing joints if you, if you can. Um, here again, an S plasty was uh, used. You can see the S shape. With the fingers, thumbs, and toes, the issue here is uh, skin's quite tight. Um, you've got the issue of potential damage to the nerves. Uh, in a lot of occasions here, if you have to do an excision, use that graft that you're uh, you're going to use. The question of local anesthetic: should you should you not use adrenaline? Um, conventional answer is that you shouldn't, and you just use plain xylocaine. But it can take quite some time for it to take effect. Um, I'd have to admit occasionally I will use some with adrenaline. I haven't run into any problems, but obviously say you had a patient with scleroderma or someone who had renal, someone who had uh, an impaired peripheral circulation, you certainly wouldn't want to use a vasoconstrictor in those circumstances. This was just a picture here of the anatomy of the uh, finger for doing um, a ring block. Generally, you go in at the loose skin, it decides first, then 
local anesthetic across here, local anesthetic across the bottom. And this was good, you know, with um, a local anesthetic without adrenaline, you've got to give it 10 to 15 minutes to take effect. Um, in this particular case here, you can see that the defect is such that it's best to try and uh, cover it with a skin graft. Usually, um, a full thickness skin graft can be used here. You just have to trim the base and lay it on. Searching in the leg, we've commented um, on the difficulty sometimes of the skin being very tight and often being very thin uh, as well. In this particular ca uh, case here, even just to try and close this, um, a keystone flap had to be done to get enough movement. Now with a keystone, remember, you're going down vertically you're maintaining your blood supply from the base, uh, the fat and the blood supply in the base, and this is moved across into the uh, into the defect here, and you end up with this type of closure here. You can see how this is moved across, but it's still got its base there, and then these areas are all sutured up. Sometimes you need to do, you know, often if you're taking a melanoma off the lower leg, um, if you don't want to do a skin graft there then uh, to get the uh, movement that's required, you need to do something like a keystone flap. This was one of the videos uh, in Paper's book as well with going in there and looking at video 99, which was on a keystone. I have a little read at most of the information here. There's a lot more information. I'm just going across very quickly. On the ankle, it's like the dorsum of the hand uh, and the dorsum of the I should say you've got to often do certain flap repairs or sometimes uh, skin grafts, especially at the lower um, ankle area here where the skin can be very tight over the lateral malleolus and the blood supply can be relatively poor as well. Um, sometimes split skin grafts are used uh, down here rather than uh, full thickness skin grafts Again, because the blood supply is relatively poor and a split thickness skin graft has less um, vascular requirements than a full thickness skin graft. So go into this, have a look at the, the various um, uh, images and uh, have a read at the, at the text here. There's a lot of good information in, uh, in this particular section. So let's pop out to Derm Consult again. You should also look at the dermatopathology topic here. We're going to cover this in the webinar itself, but have a read, uh, sorry, have a view of this video, which will go through the description of these images here and of the um, pathology. The thing about um, a melanoma. There's some various features here that are useful in uh, saying that something's a melanoma as against the nevus. Usually, in superficial spreading melanoma, it's an asymmetrical lesion and there's a lateral spread of melanocytes. Atypical melanocytes are either singly or in nest at the dermal junction, upward of pagetoid spread of cells. This is where you get the clear of melanocytes spreading up into the uh, upper layers of the epidermis and sometimes even being extruded or transeliminated. Now when these cells are up high underneath the stratum corneum, it's going to make the lesion look black. So um, whenever you've got a very dark uh, lesion and it's a thin lesion, it usually means that there's significant pagetoid spread. Again with the melanoma, the nests vary in size and they're not confined to the sides of the retinal ridges. Usually in junctional nevi, the nests uh, are fairly uh, constant in size and they're confined to the sides or tips of the retinal ridges. Um, 
Again, a melanoma, when you look carefully at it, sometimes you've got bigger dermal nests and even a few mitoses. You don't usually see mitoses in benign nevi, although you can occasionally in spitz nevi. But beware of something that looks like a spitz in someone over the age of 20 uh, with mitosis at the base. Um, be very aware that uh, it may well be a spitzoid melanoma. Again, in a melanoma, there's no dispersion of cells at the base of the lesion. It may still have a sort of pushing nest-like edge, whereas the average nevus sort of um, the cells peter out and disperse uh, into the uh, surrounding dermis. And in a melanoma, there's no maturation of the cells at the base, whereas in a nevus there is. So these were just some images of melanomas with the uh, histopathology. Have a look at these. Uh, as I say, the video will go through it anyway. It just basically um, shows you no maturation of the cells and the depth of the lesion. You just need to look at those carefully. Um, here, this would look quite a dark lesion because you've got these nests of cells pressing into the epidermis like this, almost um, uh, eating away into the epidermis. And so this is just underneath almost the stratum granulosum, so it would look quite black if there was a lot of melanin in these melanocytes. Occasionally some melanomas will even show acantholysis. Um, you know, there's a separation of the cells in the epidermis. The nests appear to uh, cause the separation to, in fact, occur. Um, and here you can see some atypical melanocytes being extruded all the way into the um, overlying stratum corneum. Uh, this is pagetoid spread, the upward spread of clear melanocytes high up into the area underneath the stratum corneum, the stratum granulosum. And this was a more aggressive melanoma. Have a good close look at this. Um, look at the deeper nests of cells that we have here and the lack of maturation. This also had about four mitoses per square millimeter in the, in the base of this. No. As far as ulcers go, the tutorial topic will look at the various types of ulcers. Have a little read through this. Ulcers are difficult. It's difficult to give you a mnemonic that allows you to um, work out a, a differential diagnosis of these accurately. Some ulcers have certain characteristics. Arterial ulcers are usually painful and they're sharply punched uh, out. Um, there's usually evidence of an impaired circulation and we've got these other types of uh, ulcers that you may see in Wegner's polyarteritis and the dose of giant cell arteritis here. You may get superficial skin necrosis um, because it's a large vessel that's usually involved. Arterial ulcers can be due to cholesterol emboli. This particularly occurs in the soles of the feet, and usually you'll get um, a levido-like pattern on the soles of the feet if it's cholesterol emboli. Remember, disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, will give you areas of necrosis of the skin, particularly in meningococcemia. Undermined ulcers, undermined edges, pyoderma gangrenosum and decubitus ulcers, pressure ulcers, particularly pyoderma gangrenosum. And the edge of the ulcer may have a bluish edge to it as well. Damage to surrounding tissues, well, you'll see ulcers, particularly with venous stasis. Um, you'll see ulcerated necrobiosis lipoidica. This is a particularly difficult condition. If you get an ulcer in that, it takes an edge to heal. And you'll see surrounding radiation damage if you uh, later on with uh, radiotherapy where you get uh, necrosis and ulceration occurring in the center. Also, tumors can ulcerate. Um, obviously, trauma, particularly dermatitis artifacta, where you get unusual sort of ulcers. Neurotropic ulcers are particularly seen on the heels, soles of the feet, over the metatarsal heads, and particularly in leprosy where you've got nerve damage. 
ulcers causing and uh, uh, sorry, infective ulcers, atypical mycobacteria, mycobacterium ulcerans, the Borrelli ulcer, uh, a particularly difficult uh, recalcitrant ulcer. Uh, if you live in an area where this ulcer, this uh, organism is common, then you're aware of it. And open surgery with excision of the ulcer is the best way to go. Then there's pyoderma gangrenosum. Uh, we've talked about it already, the underlying disorders that are associated with it. You should read up a little bit about them, particularly inflammatory bowel disease, particularly leukemias, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, these are the ones that we tend to see pyoderma gangrenosum occurring with most, but you'll get some cases where it's occurring. There isn't any obvious underlying uh, disorder. I think there's a reference there to a granulomatous type of pyoderma gangrenosum that was in uh, the archives. Uh, we'll try and have a look at that perhaps in the module and the, in the webinar. And then the, we're going to talk a little bit in the webinar about lupus profundus. There's a case in Global Skin Atlas you should have a look at. Um, typically, these patients, oops, apologies for that. Typically, these patients, uh, these patients um, have overlying discoid lupus, but not always. But in, in lupus profundus, uh, it's a paniculitis deep in the fat tissue. And so the skin's sunken in often. Uh, the differential diagnosis of this is um, a, a lymphoma that's involving the paniculus. And we'll discuss a little bit about that in the webinar itself. So have a read through. Uh, all of this. Have a look at the videos that are there, especially for the melanoma, and certainly read through the section clinical uh, module 3b in the My Skin Cancer Consult website and look at the module here on uh, surgery of the limbs. See you Monday night. Thanks very much.